So my name is uh, Tan Ong. I am an internist by training and also a geriatrician. I did my internal medicine training uh, residency at UC Davis, and then I came up to the Seattle area for additional fellowship training in geriatric medicine, and I've been on faculty for the past 10 years now, uh, so it's been a decade. And so one of my main focuses is in primary care um, and also in nursing home work. And I was invited by Barbara to give a talk about cognitive impairment in primary care. I just saw um, the previous talks that you had, and so there will be some overlap. And I will make sure that I touch base upon the four M's too. We definitely talk about mentation, of course, because we talk about cognitive impairment, but we talk about medication, mobility, and also what matters as well. So I will go ahead and start. If you have any additional questions during the talk, go ahead and type that in the chat box. Uh, Barb. Barbara is monitoring that for me, and then we will take all those questions at the very end. Okay, very good. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you should be able to identify some very common screening tools used in primary care to identify cognitive impairment in adult patients. And also, importantly, to be able to try to differentiate the different types of cognitive impairment. Sorry, well, there's a little chat box already. And so if there is um, any issues with audio visual, please um, just go ahead and stop me, Dr. Cochran, and then I will try to address that. And so hopefully my bandwidth will maintain for the entire time and duration of the talk. The other additional objective is to recognize the impact of cognitive assessments on your patients. And there's not a single slide that, um, or there's not gonna be a single talk in geriatric medicine. But in many developed countries. And so this is just a graph of the projected number of people over the age of 65 who will have dementia. And as you can see, one of the biggest risk factors that is associated with developing cognitive impairment and eventually Alzheimer's disease as well is age. And it has a lot to do with the aging population and the growing of the population that we are very familiar with. We will definitely start off with a case that um, we have seen, and you may have very similar cases, but this is an 85-year-old retired professor, and this is a professor that is from internal medicine. He's here just for a routine visit, and fortunately, though, he's coming in with the primary reason of he's having trouble with his memory, and this is his own primary words that he brings in. Uh, that he has issues with cognitive impairment, trouble remembering things, trouble with misplacing things, but really no impact upon function at, at all. He lives with his wife. He occasionally very rarely drinks alcohol for his social gatherings. He's still very much active with medicine in terms of attending grand rounds and engage with medicine residents and trainees and students as well. His past medical history is significant for Crohn's disease, but it's pretty quiet for the most part, and it's not an active problem. He has a history of anxiety and also hypertension, and for those conditions, he takes lisinopril for his hypertension, aspirin, and temazepam as needed for his anxiety, and that he also takes for sleep. And so cognitive impairment is incredibly prevalent in prime primary care, there are barriers to the diagnosis of this disease, unfortunately. And there are missed opportunities. And I find this very common in uh, when I attend on the inpatient wards where that people will, will get admitted with cognitive impairment prior, but it nowhere appears on their problem list. And, and so it's not a thing that individuals in the inpatient side pick up upon and unfortunately when individuals discharge then it's also not noted that they have pre-existing cognitive impairment prior to that they are admitted and so you can see that there's huge opportunities that are missed um, by identifying the contributing factors and the beneficial treatments 
and interventions that can uh, improve someone's cognition. And what I was talking about earlier about uh, the hospitalized setting, that one study showed that nearly 50% of acute medical admissions for people over the age of 70 had dementia, but only half of those were diagnosed at that time. And that you could see how that has a huge impact upon a person's plan of care at time of discharge. And so for a hospitalist or for a nurse to give a plan of care, sharing that information to the patient, you assume that they will remember. But unfortunately, they have cognitive impairments or frank dementia, and they're not going to re remember. And so it definitely changes the overall goals of the care and maybe needing to simplify the medical regimen and also having written instructions would be important for not only for them to look upon later time when they come home, but also for their caregivers and also their family to also look at as well. And then it's also, very um, problematic is when a person gets admitted to the hospital and there's pre-existing cognitive impairment, but it's not uh, readily available or readily uh, available information for the admitting provider. And so the history that is obtained from someone with a cognitive impairment, so there's less reliability in that, and that has huge um, downstream effects in terms of what their plan of care and also what uh, tests that may be ordered to evaluate whatever presenting symptom that they have. And there's additional missed opportunities for advanced care planning in terms of getting to well, one of the primary M's in geriatric medicine is what really matters. And so even, and, and I just want to make a point too, that even with patients with mild dementia, um, they can still very much participate in discussions and still have decision-making capacity that revolves around a very specific clinical question. And so just because a person has a diagnosis of dementia or cognitive impairment, that does not mean that you have to go to their durable power of attorney uh, at that point in time, but they can actually have the ability to make certain medical decisions, um, but that's up to the clinician uh, to decide. I think that before we launch into what cognitive impairment is, it's paramount to kind of define what normal aging is. And so there's no consistent um, really tests or there's no consistent uh, process to determine what acutely normal aging is. And let me explain to you why that is, is, is that if you can imagine the way that we determine normal is by doing psychometric tests and administering psychometric tests to people who are alive and who are coming into clinic. And so they have to be healthy enough to be able to come into clinic and they have to be healthy enough to be alive, obviously. And so you can pre-select people. And so what is quote unquote normal for an 85 year old? Is it normal for someone who is a hundred year old, old to be alive? And so is it pre-selection that we are doing uh, in terms of trying to determine what's normal? And so there's really no consistent um, uh, metrics of what is normal, quote unquote, normal from memory. What is consistent though, that, that for people who age, it is that there's some decline in processing speed and there's also some slowing of the, of the ability to recall new information. And so the adage of as a person gets older, slower and harder is true, but intact memory for current events should still be very much uh, persistent and that should not go away. So remembering who the current president, for example, is or the current events of, of, of the times is still very much intact. Retention of verbal abilities and vocabulary as well is also very much intact. And so when a person has cog impairment or a frank dementia, you will see that an individual has more prevalence in terms of word finding, they will have syntax errors, for example. And so normal aging shouldn't have any deviations from their verbal abilities or their vocabulary. And also norm normal aging, people can utilize reminders and visual tips and, and notes. And, and the one most important thing as well is that there's an absence of significant effects on a person's activities of daily living or instrumental activities of daily living. There are workarounds and so using visual tips and notes so that they can compensate for that is actually quite normal. And all the way to the other end of the spectrum in terms of from normal aging to 
dementia is this, is that a person has to have significant decline from their prior level of function with impairments in at least one cog domain. And so when a person has cognition, you can imagine there's multiple different domains in terms of their cognition. So one part of that is learning and memory. It's also important to remember that when a person has dementia, it's not only the impairment of memory, but it's the impairment of learning new things. Uh, and so it's not only, and so that's one important aspect that we tend to forget about because we always kind of focus in terms of the memory part, but it's also an impairment in the ability of learning new things. There's also could be an impairment in executive function and that has to do with the finances, for example, and complex activities. So commonly in, in primary care, we'll ask individuals or we'll ask a caregiver or a loved one, at what point in time did a person lose the ability to manage their own finances or if they are still able to do that? So a common clinical question in prime primary care is who does your finances? Do you continue to do your finances? And are there times that you have um, forgotten to pay bills, for, for example, and if that's becoming more frequent. The other domain with cognition is complex attention. This has to do with um, divided attention. And so um, the great example or a common example is if you can multitask. Can, so can you, if you can do multiple things or two things at the same time, and this has to do a lot with processing speed too. And there, like I said you know, on the previous slide, is that with normal aging, we do see that there is a slowing of the processing speed, and but divided attention becomes incredibly more difficult as a person progresses along in terms of cognitive impairments to, to the other end of the spectrum of dementia. Language, and so a person can also have impairment in language as another domain in, in cognition. And like I was saying before, word finding is a very common thing in individuals with dementia and syntax errors. So misplacing nouns and the pronouns where they belong within the sentence structure, for example. Another domain within cognition is the visual spatial. Um, domain and so failing to recognize faces or objects um, is a very another com common thing and orienting clothes to to the body putting clothes on backwards or inside out and not recognizing that for for example a visual spatial skill or a common visual spatial question that we can ask within the cognitive or in the primary care setting is if an individual commonly gets lost within a uh, route that they had taken and they were very uh, familiar with with that route but now they get easily lost and they're uh, they're having inability to reorient themselves within a very much known route or known environment another domain within cognition is social cognition and this is the thought of having empathy and and emotion and trying to regulate your own emotions. A common question that we ask within the primary care setting is, are there any changes in terms of the personality? Are there any changes in terms of their behavior? And are there any changes within their mood? And so these are the different domains that we ask about it. And so an individual has to have some sort of uh, decline from prior function with impairment and not only in learning and memory, but one additional domain, either executive function, complex attention, language, visual, spatial, or social cognition. And one of the things that it has to do is all these impacts or these decline has to have an effect on their function and their independence. And it's not a result of some sort of reversible acute medical cause such as delirium or other mental disorder. And then within the dementia, it's described as mild, moderate, and severe, and also described with or without behavioral disturbance as well. And so what I had described to you is normal aging and dementia. And so this is just a, a slide to, to summarize that in terms of primary care. And so when a person has normal aging, they will occasionally make a bad decision once in a while. But in dementia, that individual will have poor judgment and decision-making much more prevalent and, and much more 
commonly. And so one of the clinical questions that, that are the clinical encounters that come up frequently in my practice is that individuals who fall scams or fall prey to scams, uh, for example. And these scammers now definitely know that they um, can target older adults because of the presence of cognitive impairment. And so that is one of the yellow flags that makes me ask about that, as, uh, about cog impairments when a person you know, is brought into my clinic or brought in uh, attention to me by a loved one that they are falling prey to scams much more frequently. Missing a monthly payment, for example, is somewhat no normal aging, uh, but no longer being able to balance a budget is the other extreme where that this is pretty much, um, but this is a large clue for someone with dementia. Forgetting which day it is and remembering it later on throughout the day or minutes later is very much normal. But what is not normal is losing track of the season or the year. Sometimes forgetting which word to use is somewhat normal and I can definitely do that throughout this talk, for example. But difficulty with having a conversation though is not normal. Losing things from time to time, normal. I'm sure that everyone on this talk and listening to this talk has done, done that, but unable to retrace those steps is somewhat abnormal. I'm giving you time to think about where you had misplaced things and finding that is normal. Sometimes needing help using electronic device, such as a new smartphone, for example, is normal. But difficulty with a familiar task though, that is abnormal. So something that's apraxia, meaning that you knew how to do this before, but now you can't operate it any longer. More time and energy needed to encode new information is normal, but difficult and impossible to encode new information is not normal. So very similar to what uh, I had stated before, is the, the inability to learn new things is sometimes forgotten in the concept of dementia. We only kind of think about the memory, but it's also the inability to learn new things. Along that spectrum though, we talked about normal aging and we talked about dementia. There's a huge amount of um, continuum that is in between normal aging and also frank dementia. There's this concept of mild cog impairment and I'm sure that the other uh, speakers along your Alzheimer's uh, speaker series have talked about that book before. But essentially what mild cog impairment talks about or MCI talks about is that this individual, this person has mild cog decline without that functional impairment that we had talked about in dementia. So a person, most of the times, this individual will present with amnestic or memory but all those different domains that we had talked about in terms of cognition, people can have individual impairments in those domains. Those are rare, but, um, but also possible. So for example, a person can have MCI, but they can have impairment only in the language domain. They can have an MCI and they could have only problems in their judgment, for, for example. But by far the most um, prevalent type of MCI is amnestic, and so it has to do with memory. The prevalence of MCI is anywhere between 15 to 20 percent of those who are 70 years and older, and it's not necessarily a precursor to dementia. A good rule of thumb to remember is that a third of individuals who are diagnosed with MCI will actually improve back to normal. A third of individuals will exactly remain stable where they are with MCI, and then another third of individuals will progress on to dementia several years down the road. But unfortunately, it does increase your, your risk of having dementia about threefold if you do have a diagnosis of MCI. So when does it really become dementia? And so we talked about this in terms of the spectrum. And so when it becomes dementia is when there's presence of the cognitive impairment, that is detected by the history taking and the assessments that we're going to talk about. It also becomes dementia when it's a decline from their previous level of function. And most importantly, 
as well is that there's an interference with activities of daily living or instrumental activities of daily living that we talked about. So it impairs their ability to function at work or their usual activities. And it also becomes dementia when you're able to distinguish it from normal aging. And it's also dementia when you're able to exclude that there are other causes of it as well, such as delirium, other major psychiatric disorders. We talked about delirium in a little bit uh, before, but I just want to call this out is that this is a very common condition in terms of uh, in older adults as, as well. What delirium is, it's a, an acute onset of confusion. And one of the biggest hallmarks of delirium is it's a fluctuating in course versus dementia is slowly progressive over a period of time, but this is an acute abrupt change and it fluctuates in the person's course. Delirium is often defined as hyperactive or hypoactive. So the hyperactive for many of the clinicians that are on the line, uh, it's where a person is vigilant, hypervigilant. They are active, they're picking at the air, they're constantly restless and they're fidgeting. But there's also another form of delirium that is actually much more prevalent to it, um, is the hypoactive where a person is more sleepy, for example, and so they're not as activated as, as before. And again, it's acute in onset and it fluctuates the course. And fluctuating course means that over a very brief timeline, not over the span of weeks to months to years, like dementia is, but this is over the course of during an interview even, during several hours, during a day. And it's also a disturbance in the level of attention and awareness as, as well. And so even during an interview, a person will be easily distracted or they will be falling asleep. And so their level of consciousness is rapidly changing within during an interview as well. Oftentimes people will, will kind of confuse this with dementia because there's also a disturbance in cognition but one of the distinguishing things is how abrupt it is and there's also evidence that there's a consequence of another underlying medical medical condition that is contributing to that so for example many of you within your clinical experience have seen people older adults who have presented with an infection either community acquired pneumonia or urinary tract in infection and they have delirium they're acute where there's a change in a person's behavior, there's an acute abrupt change in the behavior and cognition as well. People have often thought that delirium can resolve rather quickly in terms of during the stay within a hospital, but it can actually last for months after a person is hospitalized as well. One of the things that I wanna talk about is the concept of a geriatric syndrome in terms of cognitive impairment. So oftentimes we, we like to think of conditions in buckets, but as a geriatrician, I kind of think of conditions as a syndrome, particularly conditions within older adults. And so it's quite easy or it's quite easy to think of conditions in buckets. This person is normal, this person has dementia, this person has my MCI, and this person has delirium and so those are big broad buckets but unfortunately people don't live like that and it's along a, a continuum and so this is an idea of a geriatric syndrome where individuals have intrinsic factors and extrinsic uh intrinsic factors and extrinsic factors one of the prototypical geriatric syndromes is falls so every single person on this phone call and this Zoom call, I'm confident has taken care of someone or personally known an older adult who has fallen. In your personal mind, Jared, you can already think of multiple risk factors that have contributed to that individual falling, right? And so, for example, in this diagram I have outlined here that you have the underlying medical conditions that contribute to their fall impaired vision and hearing, so sensory impairment can contribute to a person's fall. Age-related changes, for example, generalized weakness, deconditioning, muscle atrophy, contributes to a person with falling. Medications as well, being an extrinsic risk factor, 
the uh, polypharmacy that a person takes, for example, contributes to their falling, improper use of the assistive devices, or their environment can contribute to their falling. And so rather than thinking of, of things as a bucket, there are multiple reasons why a person can have the presentation of a fall. And so the, one of the hallmarks of the geriatric syndrome is that a capital in that these risk factors or these things that cause a person to present themselves or the condition of falls, for example, all these conditions cross this capital M medicine. And what I mean by that is that whose job is it to assess a person's vision? An, op an ophthalmologist, an optometrist, right? Whose job is it to assess a person's hearing? An audiologist, per, uh, perhaps, or an ENT doctor, right? And so that's the whole concept is that no one singular individual owns this field of quote unquote or this condition of falls. The similar thing could also be said of cognitive impairment. But before I go on to that, I just want to highlight this hypothetical. Um, graph here. So on the x-axis you have time, on the y-axis you have function. And so on the y-axis low levels of function and high levels of function. That dotted line represents the time point when a person loses so much function over the span of their life that they become institutionalized. And so you could imagine that there could be multiple dotted lines on this graph. One that represents assisted living, for example, that is higher up on that y-axis. And then that lower line that is displayed on your graph could be an adult family home or a skilled nursing facility. An individual has lost so much function that they crossed that dotted line, right? And so what I did is I took all those risk factors from the previous slide and graphed it here. And so all those clinical conditions and all those risk factors have some sort of impact upon a person's function. So for example, the polypharmacy has some sort of impact upon function, osteoarthritis, impaired vision, the environment, and eventually osteoporosis that we didn't talk about before. A person falls, they trip, they fall, they break their hip, and they become institutionalized within a nursing home, right? And so I went into geriatric medicine because I'm an optimist. And I'm optimistic that we can actually change the slope of those curves, the, the, the slope of that, that curve, that I'm not going to wipe away the polypharmacy. I'm not going to improve that. I'm not going to um, make a person's vision 2020 from where it is now. But what I can do, though, is I can mitigate the impact upon that risk factor upon their functionality. And so if I could just change the slope of the curve but not wipe it clean one risk factor at a time, can I do something to improve their functionality? And so that I delay the time that they cross that dotted line where they have to become institutionalized. So as a geriatrician in primary care, this is what I do on a daily basis is look at what their risk factors are, mitigate as much as I can about it so I can delay the time of onset that they cross that imaginary dotted line, maintain function as long as I can in terms of primary care before they have to become institutionalized. And so a very similar diagram could be thought of cognitive impairment. In fact, I don't think I changed very much about this from falls, medical conditions, sensory impairment, age-related changes, medications, I put in the activity and the environment. And so in actuality, it's exactly the same thing that you saw in the previous graph, right? And so the same exact thing, polypharmacy, activity, impaired hearing, environment, sleep. The same thing that I do in primary care that I do in falls, I do for cognitive impairment trying to adjust those, those risk factors and mitigate its impact upon the functionality. And so rather than thinking of things in buckets, this is dementia, this is um, normal aging, this is MCI, what I'm trying to do is look at where I can mitigate its impact upon a, a person's functionality and eventual impact upon cognition, lessen that impact and so that I could delay the time that they cross that imaginary dotted line be, before they become institutionalized. One of the biggest things I do within a primary care visit is, a, is medication review. And so you saw that in the previous graph, is that the impact of medications is huge upon cognition. 
And oftentimes, one of the things that I get asked or stated from individuals that I care for is, is that, Doc, I've been taking this for 20 years. Why should I change this now? And my typical response to that is that just like what you were able to do 20 years ago, there are certain things you can't do now, such as run a 10 minute mile. Maybe they can, but uh, for, for example, but there are certain things that have, you your body has and uh, have changed. And so your body has changed over that period of 20 years. And rightly so, your medication should change right along with it. Just because you were taking this medicine 20 years ago, that doesn't mean that you should be taking that medicine 20 years later. And so it's a constant reassessment about what is medically indicated at this point in time. What I would say is the largest impact upon medications, upon cognition is anticholinergics. And how I would think about these medicines um, as well is that it, every single medicine practically has some sort of property uh, along the spectrum of zero to high. That's so, every single medicine has some sort of properties of terms of impact upon cognition, whether or not it's low versus high. What you have here is a table seven that is taken from the American Geriatric Society Beers criteria. We won't talk too much about this, and so hopefully some uh, previous speakers have talked about it, but this basically gives you a list with medications with strong anticholinergic properties. Like I was saying before, it's a long spectrum. There are other medicines that are not on this list that have weaker, moderate effects as, as well. But one of the more common side effects about anticholinergics are poor coordination, dry eyes, dry mouth, leading to constipation, urinary retention, cog impairments that we talked about, and also delirium as, as well. But unfortunately, these medications are so incredibly common over the counter, and so it's easily accessible, unfortunately. These are just the common ones that I have found in, um, in many of my patients that have taken over-the-counter medications that I have requested and worked with peeling off and back. Many of these agents are used as sedatives, and so you will see them as sleep aids. And so every time you see a PM, for example, that usually means that there is a sedative in it that has helped them fall asleep. And oftentimes those sedatives is Benadryl or diphenylhydramine. And that is one of the uh, antihistaminic medications that have very high uh, anticholinergic properties. And, and so that's something that I commonly do is review medications in terms of its impact upon cognitive impairment, particularly someone who comes in with it. And so there have been studies that look to add to this and it has been confirmed as, as well, where in this study by Shelley Gray, uh, also from the University of Washington, who shows that there had a, there's a high cumulative anticholinergic medication is associated with increased risk of dementia. So the higher um, anticholinergic medications you're using or the more of it that you're using on a daily basis, it increases your risk of dementia. So they looked at over 3,000 older adults over the age of 65. These individuals had no dementia at the time that they stepped they entered their study. It was an observational study perspective. They followed these individuals over, uh, over seven years and they saw whether or not incident dementia occurred. And when they were taking higher anti medications or higher anticholinergic properties, the more that they took, the higher their risk of dementia along the continuum. The most common drugs that they found individuals in this study were on were tricyclic antidepressants. Some examples of what those are, amitriptyline and nortriptyline. Another common one were the first generation antihistamines, very similar to the previous slide that I had showed you there are some examples. And also bladder antimuscarinics. And so this is another commonly prescribed medicine for overactive bladder for urge urinary incontinence. And so oxybutyltoteridine uh, fall within those categories. And this is just a table that shows that is, uh, as well. And so they have a TSDD, which is the total standard daily dose of a, a uh, anticholinergic medication. And so you could see that 
the higher the total standard daily dose, the higher your risk of developing dementia uh, as well. And so that's what is that's what's trying to be shown. Benzodiazepines is a, is another common medication as as well, and it's commonly used as a sedative, so treating insomnia and also anxiety, very similar to our case presentation that we started this talk with, case number one. Unfortunately, there's conflicting studies whether dementia can be preceded by symptoms such as insomnia and anxiety and depression. And so studies have been unable to really tease apart the impact of benzos upon cognition. And the question is, well, whether or not um, people had insomnia, anxiety, and depression preceding the fact that they had, uh, that these were some preceding symptoms before that they developed frank dementia. What I could say though is the American Geriatric Society uh, in 2019 would list benzos as a medication that uh, has a very strong um, recommendation to avoid in older adults. And so that's something that you could use within your language and within your primary care practice as well as the Beers criteria and uh, the American Geriatric, Geriatric Society recommending against its use because of its impact upon cognition and other things as well, such as falls. The other thing that is commonly not talked about is hearing loss. And, and so uh, similar to the graph that I had previously displayed, hearing loss has an impact upon cognitive impairment as well. So it's a very common condition in older adults. So up to two thirds of older adults suffer from early loss. And unfortunately, Medicare doesn't pay for, for hearing aids for the most part. And it's in a very expensive out of pocket. The VA does and, and so, uh, depending on how much service connection you have. So untreated hearing loss can, uh, has been shown to experience a faster decline in thinking and memory skills than those compared with normal hearing. And so this is a study that um, enrolled nearly 2,000 uh, older adults in the mean age of 78, seven years old. They looked prospectively in terms of whether or not they developed cog impairment or not, the time that they were enrolled in the, into this prospective study, they had no pre-existing cog impairment at all. They used a modified mini mental scale or min, mini mental status exam, 3M score, uh, to define whether or not a person had cog impairment or not. And so what they eventually found once they followed these individuals over this time period was that 30 to 40 percent faster decline over six years when compared with those who did not have hearing loss. And so they measured uh, this uh, modified MMSE scale over that six year period. And so hearing impairment did speed up the rate of decline in terms of cognition. And so this is just a scale or a graph from that original study that showed that as well. So the black dot there are individuals with normal hearing and the white open dot there is the individuals with hearing loss. And so they followed individuals for over a six year period of time. They started enrollments and uh, they started doing these hearing tests at year five and then at year eight, 10 and 11 again. And so what they eventually found is that in individuals with hearing loss, that there was a 24% increased risk of cognitive impairment. There are other risk factors other than medications and also hearing loss. There's also vascular health. This has to do with hypertension, for example, and hyperlipidemia as, as well. There is overlap that for Alzheimer's dementia, for example, with vascular dementia. And so controlling uh, the risk factors, the typical risk factors that we talk about for vascular health has an impact in terms of cognitive impairment. This is over the long term and over the span of years. This isn't over the span of weeks, months uh, at all, but it's over the uh, span of years. Uh, controlling and improving someone's glycemic control uh, is important. Again, this is a long-term thing and this, this isn't necessarily an abrupt thing unless they have ketoacidosis, for example. Uh, 
Physical activity has also been associated with impaired cognition. So the less active a person is, the higher the risk of cognitive impairment that a person has. Also, as mental activity, or excuse me, mental inactivity and social engagement, the converse is true as well, is that the more mentally engaged a person is and the more socially engaged a person is, the more friends a person has, the more social interactions a person has as well, that it is somewhat protective in terms of cognitive impairment. Coming back to the case number one, this individual that had presented it was very much continuing to be engaged in his community uh, of professionals still, even in his advanced age. And so trying to keep that mental activity going. Depression and anxiety, so these two mood disorders, and particularly untreated as well, has uh, impact upon cognitive impairment. And so addressing those issues uh, and treating those smoking, uh, in fact, and very much related to the vascular health as well. And so getting people to stop smoking at, at an early age before they come to see a geriatrician is important. The uh, use of substance abuse as well, and so alcohol and other illicit and other illicit drugs have an impact as, as well. And so one of the common things that I do within my initial screen is I do ask about alcohol intake. And some, sometimes this isn't a common thing that we ask for older adults because sometimes in primary care and primary care providers, we assume that an older individual isn't drinking. But it's a very much a standard question that we should all ask for older adults whether they are continuing to drink and how much do do they drink as well? Because this does have an impact upon cognitive impairment and their cognition. Sleep disorders, and so this has to do with obstructive sleep apnea or uh, sleep REM disorders as well, is that there's a growing body of literature that inappropriate sleep or in getting not enough sleep as well that it has an impact upon the person's cognition. And again, diet is another growing body of, of literature that has a impact in terms of, of cognition. Many of you are probably familiar with the Mediterranean diet, where some studies have shown that adhering to a Mediterranean diet decreases your risk of cog impairment. All these things though on this list are things that are lifelong changes. And, and in fact, it's probably something that we should be thinking about when we're 30 or 40, even by the time the individual gets to me as a geriatrician when they're 75 and above, these are things that I talk about and so that we can intervene upon and slightly improve. But many of these modifiable risk factors are unfortunately too far downstream at this point if they're presenting me at the age of 75. And so for those of you who work with a younger cohort of patients, these are very important things to kind of talk about and um, to modify at an early time course before they get to a geriatrician. The history taking, we talked about this as, as well. And so uh, when in my primary care visit, I ask a lot of questions and I kind of gear my questioning to the different domains that we had talked about. I shared a little bit of that all already, um, but when I'm asking about learning and memory, we can even break it down further into different, uh, more granular buckets. So when talking about memory, we can ask about working memory. And working memory, for example, has to do with, for example, remembering a 10-digit phone code or phone number. That would be working memory. And so that has to do with memory that you easily store. Episodic memory has to do with memory that you um, occasionally will access. So for example, your social uh, security number, um, things that you don't use on a daily basis, but you can access it in an episodic manner. Semantic memory is more long-term where you remember things such as your birthday, that those are very granular, uh, ingrained, I mean, information that is there. Perspective memory is to thinking about the future, about, for example, in a clinic visit, I'll ask, what well, does this person have um, trouble remembering 
keeping appointments and so things within the future. And so that has to do with perspective memory. Procedural memory has to do with praxias and so uh, being able to shower independently and not missing those, those steps. Being able to cook, for example. So these are things that they might have done for many decades, but now as they're older, these procedural things that they were able to do, they're unable to do now. So you can get very much more granular into, into your history taking in terms of what type of memory impairment a person has uh, during the clinic visit. There's the executive function, uh, which we talked about, and I'm not gonna talk too much about this just because we talked about all these different domains already. The social cognition has to do with the insight. Uh, some individuals with cognitive impairment and frank dementia will lack the insight that they actually have some sort of impairment. And so uh, our case that we started off this uh, initial uh, talk was a person had insight that they were having this problem with memory. And so that's um, something that some individuals with dem frank dementia will have is a lack of insight. The purple box here are very common questions that you can also ask within a clinical encounter very, that are anchored to the 10 common uh, warning signs of Alzheimer's. So does a person have memory loss that disrupts their daily life? Do they have challenges in planning or solving problems? Do they have difficulty in completing tasks at home? Confusion with time or place? Trouble understanding a visual image or the spatial relationships of objects? New problems with words and speaking or, or writing? Misplacing things and losing the ability to retrace that we have kind of talked about? Decreased or poor judgment? Um, and again, and again, that decreased poor judgment, a common clinical question that I ask is around the finances, but it also has a lot to do with safety and the perception of safety. And so one of the common things we will ask about is fall risk and the individual's perception of their fall risk. Also changes in their behavior, so withdrawal from their work or social activities or changes in their mood or personality. Very common things that we ask within a primary care clinic visit. The other components that we also ask is how long has that pr problem been present? And, and it, for dementia and MCI, it should expand over the months to years. And so we're trying to set up what the tempo of this condition is. Is it rapidly progressive, for, for example, over the span of days, weeks? Then we're thinking of something else that is not so much Alzheimer's or one of the uh, neurodegenerative diseases that we're going to talk about. And so the when this started and what's the tempo of this condition has, uh, has, uh, will help you decide what uh, is the underlying cause of their cognitive impairment. And has there been a repeated history of traumatic brain injury as well? This is something that we're learning much, much more about. And so the uh, prototypical example are boxers, for example, who are constantly receiving punches to the face and head because of their profession. And so, and also uh, veterans as, as well, as these individuals possibly having repeated traumatic brain injuries and over a period of time, that this leads to dementia and cognitive impairment. We ask about tobacco, alcohol, and illicit drug use that I kind of had talked about before. We also ask about the Um, it is. And so oftentimes we use high school, completing high school or attaining a high school level of education as the cutoff as quote unquote adequate. But as we all know nowadays is that just because you completed high school and completed 12th grade, that doesn't mean that you are reading at a 12th grade level. And so it might be has to do with uh, the quality of the education that you have had to. We also ask about hobbies, and it's a common question that I ask within my clinical encounters when I'm meeting somebody, because I'm trying to get, well, what did you like to do before, and are you 
enjoying that still? And are you still doing that? And why did you give it up? And so that helps me to understand if there's an underlying mood disorder or if it's some issue related with purely cog impairment that is impairing the ability to participate with their hobbies. I review their medications that we had talked about and I try to corroborate the history. And this is a fine line of giving the individual, the older adult autonomy, and also then involving other members of their family or their social environment, where that I ask the older adult, is it okay if I call your significant other? Is it okay if I call your, your family members? Because I have additional questions that I have, particularly if an individual is showing up by themselves. And one of the most important things that I ask about, not that this, that you can modify this at, at all, but it definitely increases your, your risk and particularly is a family history. Is there a family history of Alzheimer's or some sort of cognitive impairment or some sort of dementia? Because this will increase your risk of personally having dementia uh, yourself if there is. That perhaps is probably the uh, only family history question that I ask is whether or not a person has a history of dementia. There are non-modifiable risk factors like we had talked about that has to do with a person's uh, family history. And Apple E4 is probably the most well-studied major genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. There are pleomorphic effects of Apple E4. Uh, when what Apple E4 does is that in that it interferes with the A beta. So the amyloid accumulation is thought to that individuals with Alzheimer's, they're unable to clear this from the brain. And then these uh, beta plaques, amyloid plaques are deposited within the brain. And so there is a uh, thought that it's because this Apple E4 it, uh, uh, risk factor that it impairs the ability to clear this from the uh, brain. And then because it accumulates it, it damages the blood uh, vessels to the brain, and then it causes leakage to the blood brain barrier. So the lifetime risk for Alzheimer's disease is nearly 50% for individuals with Apple E4, whether you have two of its genes. And if you're heterozygotes, then it's lower for, for that. What do I look on my examination when I'm in the primary care setting? The first thing that I look for is their vials, and it has to do with the cardiovascular risk factors that we looked at or we had talked about. So I'm looking at their heart rate. I'm looking at also their weight uh, as well and their BMI. I'm looking at their blood pressure, looking at those cardiovascular risk factors to see if I can find out if they have hypertension, that long standing that could be a contributing factor to their cognitive impairment that they're presenting with. I also pay attention to their appearance. So for example, if a person is well put together or they're disheveled, that helps me to corroborate the history that I'm maintaining, whether or not they have the ability to present themselves to the doctor's visit in a uh, well-dressed manner or not. I'm also paying attention to the interview and paying close attention to the language if I can pick up word finding or syntax errors as, as well. And during the interview, I'm paying attention to hearing impairment if I have to raise my voice uh, because that's one of the modifiable risk factors that we, that we can uh, improve in, in terms of person's cognitive impairment and also quality of life, if we can improve the person's hearing. In terms of the psychiatric, I'm, during the interview, I'm trying to perceive what the content of the interview is, their level of attention, trying to distinguish between the presence of delirium or not. Uh, I'm trying to assess what their mood is and their affect and the presence of hallucinations, if they have any, because that will lead me down to a specific type of dementia. And for their mood and affect, I'm trying to use standardized screens for depression and anxiety. And that's what I would encourage is that we will talk about standardized screens for cognitive impairment in primary care. But I would encourage you to also use standardized screens for mood disorders. So become familiar um, with one or two and stick with those. So for example, the PHQ-9 or the GAD-7, 
or um, whichever one or uh, you are most familiar with. On the uh, head and neck exam, I'm looking at their facies. I'm looking for the presence of masked uh, facies or flat facies where it would lead me down to a Parkinson's disease or Parkinsonism. Uh, I'm looking in their ear canals, particularly if they have hearing impairment and seeing if I can uh, improve their hearing impairment if they have earwax by irrigating their ears. It's probably the most gratifying primary care procedure I can do is to actually clean out someone's ear and then improve their hearing immediately there. And that just takes a couple of minutes to be able to do that. And if there is truly hearing impairment, then I'm trying to, and then I will do it in office otometry at that point to document that and to do, document the severity of their hearing impairment and then refer them to an audiologist and hopefully um, to hearing aids eventually. I'm doing a cardiovascular exam, again, looking for those vascular risk factors that we talked about, listening to their heart to see whether or not there is a presence of atrial fibrillation if their heart is regular. Um, perhaps they had a stroke from atrial uh, fibrillation and so uh, doing a cardiovascular exam. The neurological exam, I'm focusing on whether or not there's focal um, deficits, seeing if this is consistent with a stroke that they might have had in the past. And one of the most important neurological exams I can do for a multitude of reasons is watching a person walk. Now that am I only looking at them from a neurological perspective, I'm watching their functionality as, as well. And so um, there are certain things I'm trying to pick up, whether or not they have a shuffling gait, the consistent with Parkinsonism or Parkinson's disease, and also their tone as well, um, that can be suggestive of that as well. All of those things that we talked about in terms of physical exam, if all those things are normal, meaning there's nothing abnormal about their physical exam at all, then one of the things that it leads me down the path of is Alzheimer's disease, is that essentially when there's an absence of all of those physical exam findings potentially that you can find and it's perfectly normal and the history is consistent, by far the number one reason why a person has a cog impairment could be Alzheimer's disease. This is by far the number one cause and it's 60-80% of all cases. It usually occurs after the age of 60 and there's clear evidence of decline in memory and learning and at least one of those other domains that I had talked about. Typically um, the individuals will present with the amnestic type where it's uh, impairment in memory and, and being able to learn new things. But just recognize that there are atypical presentations of Alzheimer's disease that are non-amnestic. -am so people can have an impairment purely in language or they can have an impairment purely in the executive um, domain, for example. But by far, the most typical presentation is the amnestic type. And people with Alzheimer's will have a steadily progressive disease and but they, will have a gradual decline without the plateaus that you might see in a person with vascular dementia. Prognosis, by the time that a person is diagnosed, is anywhere between three to 10 years. And on imaging, you will see global atrophy in a small hippocampus. And this is just to show you where, what that looks like. And so on the left-hand side of your screen is someone with a normal brain. On the right hand side is someone with Alzheimer's where this is the hippocampal area where it's very much shrunken compared to where you see that it's nice and full on this side for example. And this is just a uh, hippocampal volumes that you can obtain on an MRI whether you could uh, measure how large the hippocampus is and so this is a healthy brain versus the right side of your screen where that individual has Alzheimer's disease where it's a much smaller hippocampal volume as well and of course you see all the uh, global atrophy that uh, this individual with Alzheimer's disease has all this black space here are represents how shrunken the brain is compared to someone who has a healthy brain upon the left side. The second most and the third leading cause perhaps is vascular dementia. And this can occur without 
or with a diagnosed stroke in the past. And when I'm looking for this, um, this uh, etiology in patients, I'm looking for it on physical exam. And so oftentimes the clinical features are really consistent with the vascular, where the vascular insult was. Uh, and so it, when this, um, a person has vascular dementia, the onset is usually temporarily related to the vascular event that a person had. There's definitely a prominent decline in their complex attention, processing speed, and executive function. And also on imaging, there's definitely evidence of cerebral vascular disease. Oftentimes, these individuals have risk factors for vascular, uh, cardiovascular risk factors as, as well. And on imaging, you'll get small vessel strokes. And so this is defined as bilateral th thalamic lesions. And, all, and it can also be described as multiple basal ganglia thalamic or frontal uh, white matter lacuna strokes. You need at least two in the basal ganglia area or at least two in the frontal white matter. Or you'll also see uh, some radiologists describe it as extensive periventricular white matter lesions. And these are all evidence of small vessel strokes that they, the individual has had over a period of years to decades that eventually lead to vascular dementia. Classically, it presents with a stepwise progression that is associated with repeated vascular insults, but it can be definitely gradual as, as well. And so you'll see these images um, described by a radiologist on MRI um, in terms of the cortical and subcortical changes that is related with the vascular insult. And the third and possibly the second leading cause who, which is vying for the vascular dementia is dementia with the blue body. Most frequently this is men. And so I can remember fondly um, my first case where I saw this as in a residence as a resident in internal medicine was at the VA. Uh, and, and so it's most frequently described in men and it's the age of onset is much earlier in individuals with Alzheimer's disease. So that individuals can present as young as 50, but they can present as late as 85. And so there's a wide, wide range of age presentation. The onset is insidious, but it progresses rather faster than Alzheimer's dementia, rather than three to 10 years that we had talked about. This is, uh, it progresses quicker. One of the core features of dementia with Lewy body disease is that it's fluctuating in cognition. And there's this also fluctuating in the person's attention and alertness. Often it's described as a person just stares vacantly forward and for long periods of time. Uh, it's also classically described as, as someone who has visual hallucinations, often described as seeing small animals and small people. Oftentimes these visual hallucinations are non-threatening. And oftentimes as well, another core clinical feature is that they will have signs of movement disorders that are very similar to Parkinson's disease. And the onset of these motor symptoms are usually within a year before the person has the de um, decline in cognition. Other, some other uh, features that a person with dementia with a Lewy body will have are REM sleep disorders, are also a severe neuroleptic sensitivity. And so individuals who are exposed to an antipsychotic like um, Haldol, for example, they will have severe sensitivity to this and have dramatic reactions to it, and it's not recommended to be used. Imaging usually will show uh, global atrophy throughout the brain. The next most common type of dementia is frontal temporal dementia, and depending on what cohort you read and what studies you read, it'll range between one to five percent. This is again happening at a much earlier age, under 60 of age, and uh, it's usually gradual in on onset. that is listed there. So they either have disinhibition, they might have apathy or loss of empathy, they have some sort of um, compulsive behavior, 
Um, and there's also a prominent decline in their social cognition, meaning that they've lost the, uh, they lack the empathy or they've lost the empathy and to be able to connect with others on an emotional level. And they have also lost their executive abilities. And unfortunately, because of these behavioral s symptoms, it's oftentimes mistaken for mental health illness. And so there is some theory that be before that some of these individuals were misdiagnosed as having schizoaffective disorder with in fact they had frontal temporal dementia, for example. And on imaging though, you will find that there is a vast atrophy in the frontal temporal area of the brain. And that's outlined here within this image here that you could see the screen on your right uh, compared to the one that is on your left, which is normal, the one on your right showing FTD or frontal temporal dementia, that they have this. Um, sorry, my cursor key is disappearing, this atrophy in the frontal area of, of the brain that is much more prominent compared to the global atrophy that we would see in someone with Alzheimer's dementia, for example. The other type of um, dementia that, is, that you will also see commonly in primary care is normal pressure hydrocephalus. Oftentimes, the way that this individual will present is that it will have a triad. And those triad of symptoms has to do with their gait, their cognitive impairment, and also the presence of urinary incontinence as, as well. But how to solidify the diagnosis actually by imaging is that you will have enlarged ventricles and that will show on the next slide. But it, a person with NPH or normal pressure hydrocephalus will be described as having in this magnetic gait where it's really hard for a person to start to initiate their gait and their feet literally appear like they're stuck to the ground. Um, and the cognition is very similar to um, dementia and it's kind of hard to separate that out. But the other hallmark of this triad of symptoms is the presence of urinary incontinence. Um, and the MRI looks like this. And so you, you will see that this person, for example, has uh, these enlarged ventricles that is here. So in panel B, in, on the lower panel here, it is due to uh, obstructive hydrocephalus. And so you see that these really large uh, ventricles. And so not only does a person have a triad of those symptoms of the gait, the cognition, and the urinary incontinence, but they also have the imaging of these very large ventricles um, that would be consistent with NPH. Another common type of dementia that is often found in primary care is substance-induced dementia. And probably the most common substance is alcohol. And so Wernicke's, for example, Korsakoff um, is commonly described. And so people who have had continuous excessive amounts of exposure to alcohol where they're drinking alcohol for long periods of time and for their, throughout their lifetime has, and this substance unfortunately is toxic to the brain uh, and it, um, impairs and presents with cognitive impairment as, as well. Methamphetamine has also been shown to uh, cause similar uh, side effects as well for chronic use. Uh, the thought is that unfortunately that when you stop the substances, just depending on the duration of exposure to these substances, that withdrawing the substances might not improve their cognitive impairment as, uh, as we might think or hope. And it persists beyond the time of withdrawing from the substance. And probably then another common type that you would see is mixed dementia. And what that essentially means is that it's a combination of that, of all these things. I would say that probably Alzheimer's being the most common, the vascular dementia probably being the second most common, and maybe the third most common in primary care that I personally see is mixed, is that it's multifactorial, that there are unfortunately other contributing factors that lead to a person who has cognitive impairment uh, significant enough to be called for dementia. And it's just a combination of all those etiologies.
There are other forms of dementia-like symptoms as well that we will not talk about, uh, where it's the prion disease, and so kretzfeld jakob disease, and the, this is rapidly progressive. Parkinson's disease, oftentimes the presenting symptom is the motor symptoms, very similarly to Huntington's disease, where the motor symptoms are different. In Parkinson's disease, it's described as this resting tremor that a person has, and oftentimes it's when in the upper extremities that is most pronounced and often described. With Huntington's disease, it's described as chorea. And oftentimes this is much, much earlier within the 30s or 40s that this is uh, presenting and also a family history of it. Chromatic, uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, so this is CTTE, where a person has had repeated brain, uh, traumatic brain injuries and we see this in veterans who have been uh, repeatedly exposed to bomb blasts and also uh, boxers and also football players. So in contact sports that uh, can predispose an individual to repeated brain injury. The other form of dementia that can also be seen in primary care is HIV associated dementia. And so people who've had HIV and AIDS for long periods of time that could be uh, not have been treated can develop HIV-associated dementia. Just coming back to case number one, is that if you recall, it's been a long time since we talked about it, but this was an individual who was remarkably functional that was coming in, having intact insights to say, hey, doc, I got something wrong with my, my memory. And so, fortunately, this person's exam was completely unremarkable, except for the fact that this person had mild hypertension, systolic so blood pressure is in about the 150s, lower 150s, and this person was also obese. So what we did for, for this individual, for this professor, was we asked him to stop the temazepam and the alcohol, and we asked for a sleep study too, uh, because uh, whether or not we can improve a person's sleep can impact their level of, uh, impact their cognition and hopefully improve their cognition. What we also did was did some cognitive testing. What I would say about the COG testing within primary care is that particularly the single um, test that, that you are probably already familiar with is that unfortunately these tests are accurate in distinguishing clinical Alzheimer's type dementia from normal cognition in older adults. But their accuracy though, unfortunately, fall off and, and where that when you're trying to detect more mild clinical Alzheimer's type dementia from normal cognition, it becomes a little harder. And so if you're thinking about dementia and uh, cog impairment in terms of a continuum, it's, a, it's easy for these tests, single tests, to detect normal from clinical Alzheimer's type dementia where you can get that information from the history. You can get that information uh, from physical exam and you can detect it. And these tests are great in distinguishing normal. including the history taking, including the family history, including tests and imaging, it definitely helps you uh, with the diagnosis whether or not a person has dementia. But it, what it does also help with these singular tests that we're going to talk about, it identifies individuals who can warrant further evaluation. And I think that's probably the, what the one key is that in people like our case presentation, our case one and this professor, that it identifies individuals who can warrant further evaluation if needed, if it's positive. What I would share is this, and please use this as a resource for those of you who are in Washington state, you might be familiar with this, that there's a Dementia Action Collaborative and the website is there. And so this is a great algorithm that an individual can use, whether in primary care. So uh, 
for many of you who practice in a clinical setting, you're probably aware of the Medicare annual wellness visit, where you're already required to do some sort of cog screen at this point. And so in this algorithm, it walks you through this annual screen and it talks about different uh, screens that we'll review. If a person is normal, then you follow up within a year. And if they have a mini cog, which I would call out that in this um, algorithm, that their mini cog is less than four. And so that is uh, where it's trying to raise the cut point, where that it's more sensitive to detecting changes, early changes, uh, rather than waiting to, till later. But as you all probably already are aware of, a cut point for a minicog is usually less than three, where it is uh, usually used for dementia screening. But for this algorithm, they chose a cut point of four. And so that's why there's that asterisk there. And we'll review many of these tests because I do think that it is important to use. And so if they screen positive, then you go on to a further assessment, a more in-depth assessment in terms of their uh, uh, using a more sophisticated and more in-depth tool, and then taking more of a history and including uh, more from the family or caregiver uh, or other loved ones that may be involved in their care. And if these are uh, positive, then, then you move on to other things as well that we'll talk about. And if they're normal, you can follow up within a year, okay? A very similar, just know that the Alzheimer's Association also has an algorithm. Not that you need to remember this, but just recognize that different algorithms will have different tools that they recommend. But it's very, very s similar though, that in an annual screening, it should be used in your Medicare annual wellness visit and also within prim primary care. Um, you start the review, uh, the clinical observations, self-reported concerns, very similar to our case one. And then you find out whether or not signs or symptoms are present. If, if no, then you proceed down this route um, of doing some sort of early screening, such as a mini cog again, or this GPC cog that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. One of the important things that both of these, all of these algorithms is that there is a call that you use a screening tool for the patient and you use a standardized screening tool for informants. And so this is where you could either ask the caregiver or a loved one either in that clinic setting or do it over the phone. And so it's helpful to corroborate that history whether or not cognitive is, in, is present or not. We'll talk about the mini cog, and, and so many of you are familiar with this. What I will call out though is that um, the mini cog, would, and you'll see different versions of this on the internet, but banana sunrise and chair were the three original words that were used, and I still continue to use this. You'll find different iterations of uh, these words, but one of the words needs to be something that is abstract. And abstract means that you can't touch it. And so, for example, you'll see sunrise in this, you'll see other iterations where it'd be friendship, bravery, or some sort of thing that is more abstract that you really can't touch. The other thing that I will call out about the mini cog too, is that the way that it is administered, and this is very commonly mis mis mistaken, even at our attending level and faculty and residents and fellows too, is that you give a patient the three words to recall and, and ask them to repeat it. At a later time, you're gonna ask them what those three words are. But then you move on to the clock draw. But one of the most important things that sometimes gets lost is that clock draw instructions are stepwise. So for example, in these instructions, it's this. Please draw a clock in the space below. Start by drawing a large circle. So you pause and so you wait until the individual draws that large circle. And so that's why you see in parentheses, when this is done, say, put all the numbers in the circle, you pause, right? And you wait for the individual to put all the numbers in the circle. Now set the hands to show 11, 10 or 10 past 11. And so all those things are stepwise, but unfortunately when I've seen these administered, 
all those instructions are run together in one complete sentence. And so now not only did you ask your patient to do a three item recall, but you just gave them a, um, a incredibly complicated set of instructions. And so this original test was to meant to test executive function and visual spatial skills, but now you're asking them to also test these complex instructions and also the three item recall. And so make sure that you try to administer the test as it was originally developed to where these things were stepwise in terms of its instructions. And the cutoff again is three, um, but what we were talking about before is that algorithm from uh, the Alzheimer's Collaborative or the Dementia Collaborative in Washington State, the initial screen is four, okay. I actually love the Minicog just because it's incredibly easy to administer and it's easy to memorize and all it requires is a paper and pencil. And it has less effect on education level than the mini mental uh, and the sensitivity and specificity of uh, the Minicog is very, very similar to the mini mental SAS exam. And those of you are probably already aware, the mini mental SAS exam, the MMSE is copyrighted and so it costs money nowadays to actually be able to uh, utilize it and scan it into your medical record system. The other one that is commonly used, and this is called the GPCOG. Uh, it stands for the General Practitioner Assessment of Cognition. And I have it here displayed. And it's more about a resources for the individuals on the call and not for you to memorize. And so just know, be familiar with one or two of these uh, tests and be uh, able to administer these standardized screening tools. And this is relatively quick to administer to and very similar sensitivity and specificity. And it's a six items to, uh, to administer. Okay. Again, it has the clock draw. Like I said before, is that both of those algorithms that we had shared earlier include an informant standardized screen. And so this is the accompanying uh, GP COG informant. And I, and I utilize this often, and I utilize this also in the inpatient setting for those examples that I had initially uh, started to discuss at the beginning of this talk where an individual gets admitted to the hospital and their cognitive status is unknown, but by my clinical history taking, and there are yellow flags to suggest that this individual has a pre-existing cognitive impairment that has gone undetected. And so I will pick up the phone call and ask and, uh, and call their loved ones or who is listed as their primary contact and go through these, these questions. And the total score is down, down there. Uh, and it's a pretty quick thing to use as well. And I love the fact that there's a don't know uh, just because uh, certain individuals might not be familiar with that aspect of the patient's life. Okay, so the patient's, yeah. I just wanted to mention, I've got some questions that have come in and we're sort of getting towards the end. So how would you like to handle this? Well, let me take, take, take the questions first because I want to make it applicable, so. Okay, so um, the first question is, um, with family caregivers, um, given 99% of them don't know what type of dementia their loved one has, um, this person mentioned that it's important um, because Lewy body, for instance, is very different from vascular or frontal temporal. Um, are clinicians really just diagnosing and telling family members it's just dementia, or are they actually talking to them about the type? You know, I. Um... I can't speak for all clinicians in primary care. I think it has to do with your level of comfort and your level of training. Um, but usually within a primary care setting and um, individuals should be talking about what type of dementia that a person thinks that they have. Um, and the reason being is that there are certain interventions that can be helpful and there is also prognostic uh, information that we should be talking to our patients. For example, like we, I had shared earlier, Alzheimer's has a prognosis of three to 10 years. Um, and if you catch it early enough, it has a lot to do with prognosis. And one that big M that we talked about, uh, four M's, is what matters. 
and ultimately knowing how long you're going to live and what deficits you're going to experience and if it's going to be progressive that will be important to know and so hopefully that your primary care physician or provider is talking about the type of dementia too. And it's okay to say, you know what, I'm really uncertain about the type because it could be mixed because a person can have a history of heavy drinking prior, was a boxer or a veteran. Um, and there is also evidence of traumatic brain injury. And so it can be definitely a mixed picture. And so that's why it's sometimes hard to just separate these things out, particularly if you're presenting in your 80s, in your 90s. But by far, if you're playing probability and odds, Alzheimer's is, is high on the list. Okay, and then also about dementia types, is um, substance-induced dementia similar to frontal temporal um, in how it presents? You know, off, often not, actually. It, individuals, and, and it has to do with the, if they are active users or not. And what, what I mean by that is you can imagine if a person is actively using methamphetamine, their behaviors are going to be erratic. Um, and so it really depends on the clinical context. But if you're talking about someone who has used previously for chronic extended periods of time, years throughout their, their kind of older adulthood life before they got to the quote unquote geriatric age, um, then those individuals though, actually present with Alzheimer's like where they have inability to learn new things um, and memory impairment. Uh, and so it really kind of depends on the clinical context if they're actively using. Because if you can imagine a person actively drinking and coming down or off of alcohol can have erratic moods as well. Uh, and so it just depends on how far that exposure is. Okay, and then um, someone has said, as a geriatric social worker, they're often looking for primary care physicians who have this knowledge and have a focus on geriatrics. Would you have suggestions on how to make that connection? You know, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I am a dying field. Uh, you, you would think that supply and demand or the demand would uh, garner a greater supply of geriatric specialists, but that unfortunately is not the case. What I would recommend is that the American Geriatric Society has a website and on that website, it has a link where you could try to find a provider. And so these are registered um, geriatric providers with throughout the nation. So unfortunately there's about only 5,000 of us um, out there for the entire nation of the US population where we're talking about millions of people on my first slide. Yeah, uh, it's hard. So linking with the AGS website, um, is there any sort of resource that um, the social worker might um, check in with um, that she's not or he's not aware of? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cognitive concerns? Yeah, and so my very last slide that I have is of the Alzheimer's Association. And I would say that that is probably, if you have someone that you are caring for, and this goes for all clinicians, utilize the Alzheimer's Association because they have a hotline 24 hours, seven days a week that, they, that, you, should use, that you should use as a resource. They have a local chapter as well. I have personally used that when I was training early on, for example, with behavioral issues and calling up and asking her for advice. And these are um, sourced from the community and sourced from patients with prior experience. And it might work uh, for these individuals, um, such as interventions to address specific behaviors. Um, and that's what I would say is, is that use the Alzheimer's Association. There's a lot of resources that are dedicated to dementia, cognitive impairment. You just have to know where to access it. Alzheimer's Association is one. Your local AAA uh, is another one. Area Agency on Aging um, is also another resource to utilize. Thank you so much. We're caught up on the questions. So we're also towards the end of the time, but um, I'm going to turn it back over to you if you're willing to continue on. Um, and there were, are probably people who would also be really interested in hearing more because 
I'm getting a lot of chats that they've really appreciated your perspective. Oh, great. Um, and then I have to what time, Barbara? Um, well, we're, we're sort of at time, but okay. we, we have gone a good, in the past, a good 10 minutes or so. Okay. You know, I, well, I will kind of stop here and a lot of my slides have to do with the screening tools. What I would say to that is that use it as a resource and at once. So I didn't expect to actually get through all my slides, but I just wanted it to be a resource for those individuals who attended and, and so that you know the pros and cons of using that. Uh, one additional note about this is that there's a section about COVID, which I will just kind of jump into just real quick. Um, is that with COVID, many of our encounters have moved over the telephone and to telemedicine as well. And just recognize that very little, not in, many of these tests weren't validated for that type of environment. And so recognize that people can have hearing impairment. There's many variables that can cause a person not to completely understand what you're trying to administer. Uh, that is list that is listed here. I'm sure there are many, many more. But there are uh, this this one singular recent study that looked at um, specific tests for cognition that were actually tested in different environments that could be helpful in COVID. So there's a MOCA telehealth, there's a MOCA telephone, there's a brief test for adult cognition, there's also the tics. And so these are some of the better validated tests and they are also in your slide set uh, as, as, as well. And so um, just trying to adjust with our current in, environment um, that we can't have in-person assessments. Okay, and, and I'll just take, and I'll stop there. Okay, do we have any other questions? We did have somebody, Robinruff, um, that had their hand raised, and I wasn't sure if there was a question there, if you want to put it in the chat. Um, uh, Mary Zeitner just mentioned um, to remind everyone that patients and caregivers um, can find some real help at the Alzheimer's Association with um, managing aspects of all types of dementia as well. Uh, and there's a question, um, have, well, have you found it difficult to have mentation conversations over the phone? And if so, would you ask the patients and family to come in or try to have a conversation via Zoom or other platform? You know, um, what I usually do in that instance is to have two separate discussions and just trying to lessen the variables and the distractions. And so there's one that is very much focused on the patient that we is the focus and so trying to get a history from that individual and you learn a lot actually just by purely the language and the interview and where people take you uh, in terms of the conversation and the interview and then there's a separate discussion then also of uh, with the family member and again asking permission from the patient if this is okay and oftentimes I've never had someone who says no that's not okay um, but I imagine that someday that I will. Um, but there's two separate discussions that I have. And so having multiple people entering into a conversation at the same time is a bit distracting, particularly if you're trying to focus in on, on someone's attention and cognition. Okay, I don't have any other Q and A's um, or chats coming in. So Dr. Ong, thank you so much. There's um, some really overwhelming chats that would identify specific aspects that were very clinically relevant for the attendees. So thanks much and everyone will see you next year. Thank you very much, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.